pages, and lo and behold, there is a review of that book of mine. So far, I've only seen one. And I'll say no more. Please, for those of you who have the time to Google cognitive dynamic systems and read what that neuroscientist is saying, when I saw it, when I saw it, I said, wow, I'm going to leave that to you yourselves. Now, well, that is the special issue of the PROC IEEE that appeared in December 2012, just a few months ago. The cover had cognitive control on it. And why? Well, it was 2012, right? When was it the IEEE came into being? Well, it used to be called what? Institute of Radio Engineers. I think that's what it was, wasn't it? And indeed, the, the Electrical uh, Engineering Society or institution combined with the radio engineers, it became the IEEE, and 2012 was celebratory. Publication of the IEEE, well, I was glad to see my pipe, our paper be part of it. So I think that about finished it. And let me share with you the essence of what I'm working on. I am really determined to come closer and closer to the human brain. How am I going to do it? Well, the brain is very, will never be able to come anywhere close. It's almost like getting up on a mountain, and all we're doing is tail at the very bottom, but we're climbing higher and higher. Right? Well, I've taken my first step going up. I think the next one will be two or three steps closer. What exactly is it? Well, basically, the one lesson I have learned from the human brain, it has a lot of neurons, billions of them. Synaptic weights, neurons distributed throughout. Well, I've borrowed a term that uh, Fuster, <coughs> brought in his book, namely the cognate. The cognate, if you like, in engineering terms, a sub subsystem, right? How do you define a network? Well, I define a network to be a system of systems, right? And every system is made up of a number of subsystems. So a subsystem, you could say, is a cognate, right? In other words, when I have, if you like, a network, I have a very large number of subsystems and therefore a large number of cognates. Right? First of all, I have layers. Indeed I do. Now what else have I learned from the brain? Believe it or not, the neurons, is relative, the neurons are relatively simple. So therefore, I'm saying, when I build my cognates, I try to make them simple. How do I, how do I realize that simplicity. Well, I bring in sparse coding and information filtering. Information filtering is based on the Fisher information, right? And it's mathematically equivalent to the Coleman filter. I'm keeping it linear. Notice, I am, you know, linearity, provided you don't have one linear layer on another, because otherwise you have just one big linear system. Right? You want to separate one linear cognate from the one above it in some nonlinear fashion. Well, that is where my sparse coding comes in. Right? But the information filter is linear, and the step size, the step space model on which it's based, it's the simplest possible. What is it? The random walk. The only thing that drives it is the process noise. Right? So in other words, therefore, it's almost like saying, I have the state at time n is equal to the state at time n, sorry, the state at time n plus 1 is equal to the state at time n plus noise. And it's the noise that elevates the state from the previous one to the next. To the next. Right? So that is the is my cognate. And how many of them do I have? Believe me, 500 to 1,000. Why? Because I'm going for simplicity, and to make up for simplicity, I have a large number. On the other side, 
I have another cognate, one for decision making, the other one for reinforcement learning. Right? And it's the decision maker that provides them the, the buffer from one cognate to the other. And reinforcement learning, I go for Q learning, or I could use for SASA. It's linear, simple, and away I go. Right? But again, if I have 500 or 1,000 sexual cognates on one side, I will have an equal number of the other. Right? And then I bring my memory, my so-called working memory, to couple them. Now, we've, we've gone, or at least I've gone, as the further. Before, we used, believe it or not, two inner filters. That article that I've described to you has two inner filters. One inner filter going from the receptor to the receiver, the other one going in the opposite direction. And it worked beautifully if I had correlated errors. But I want to go further. So what do I do? I bring in probabilistic reasoning. And I'm a big believer in the Bayesian. Bayesian literally dominate my whole structure. Right? And I go up layer by layer, right? And my golly. And what is my stabilizer? The cognitive memory. Sorry. You have a while, after a while, you know, you are so enamored with cognition, everything is cognitive, whatever. It's a working memory. That is where I made my error, you know? It's a working memory that does the correction. And what is it I'm doing? There will be an experiment based on what I've described. But how do I convince you that the waking memory is a stabilizer? Well, that actually, if you like, is my other project. I will use mathematics, literally, to prove that indeed that working memory is responsible for stability. But never, nevertheless, that memory is distributed. It's not just like the way it used to be with control, where there's only one place where stability is guaranteed. Stability through working memory is distributed. Why is it, earlier on, someone in Japan taught me that entropic memory is an actual fact, right? Is in the form of a matrix. Well, if you look at this structure, I have, if you like, entropic states horizontally, I have entropic states vertically. So indeed, it is a matrix. Well, I'm not saying I've come very close to the thing, not really, but I think I am further ahead. I don't have it in writing, in the form of a paper, but nevertheless, in a year or two, it'll be out. Right? And with that, I think I better stop. I'm going to pass my five ten by about five ten minutes, and I hope you forgive me for that. You forgive me for that. So, any good questions that you have?